This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosting an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at virginiarodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. Working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond to all our viewers and a special welcome back to Shelyan Davis, Fredericksburg Freelance Star, Craig Carper, WCBE Radio. We're having a conversation on Monday and the election is coming up very soon and really interested in hearing from the two of you and a little bit later two of your colleagues about what has really shaped this election not asking you for predictions. If you want to make them, you can. But, but what, what are the issues or what, what really has shaped where we are here now in the closing days before the election? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think a lot of what shaped it is national stuff. I mean, I, I think recently the, the federal government shutdown has had um, an impact uh, on the race. Both candidates have been talking about it. I mean, both, both the major party candidates. Obviously, there's also a libertarian. Um, and so that shaped it. I think um, personality issues and, and personal, I guess, dealings have shaped the race a lot. Um, I know that the, the Terry McAuliffe campaign has really been trying to hit the Cuccinelli campaign on uh, social issues, whereas the Cuccinelli people have really tried to hit Terry McAuliffe on his business dealings um, and question, you know, ethical things. And so I think those have been some big factors in the race that have shaped it so far. Great. That's true. Um, you know, I think that... Uh, that Shelley had mentioned the national issues. Every, we've got this long-standing, I don't know if you want to call it a tradition or not, but uh, the, of the opposite party of whoever is in the White House typically winning the, the governor's race here in Virginia. So I don't know if it's this election, there's so much anti-Washington sentiment and a lot of it directed at the GOP. It'll be really interesting to see how that dynamic plays out on the whole race in, in general. Um, you know, I think uh, I think one of the interesting things that uh, that I've noticed about this uh, race is how the dialogue has kind of changed, evolved throughout the process. Before, as Terry McAuliffe was getting ready to run, he was talking a lot about job creation, being a job creator, and uh, the, uh, this this green tech. Uh, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a scandal or not, but uh, the, the, his dealings with uh, green tech have kind of. Um, Put that on the back burner, and he's now moving away from his as much talk about job creation as uh, being a bipartisan consensus builder. I think Cuccinelli has kind of maybe gra gravitated, moved, started trying to uh, run at the center, and now is trying to move back toward his base, uh, seeing that he's having some trouble with women and independence. You know, you mentioned the, the libertarian candidate, and tell our viewers we're having the conversation before. We know for certain whether the Libertarian is going to be in the final debate or not. Right. WDBJ7 um, down in Roanoke and Blacksburg, um, Virginia Tech and Blacksburg, are sponsoring the final debate, and that's coming up this Thursday. And um, at the moment, Robert Sarvis, the, the Libertarian, is not allowed in that debate. Um, 
WDBJ said that he needed to get 10 percent in um, an aggregation of polls, and when they cut it off, he was at like nine and a half percent. I'm, I've heard reports also that the Cuccinelli camp does not want him in the race, um, but but that that is being lobbied and discussed, and that they're, I mean, that they could change their mind, they could let him in. Doesn't want him in the debate, I'm sorry. Yeah, and our, our viewers will be seeing this program in Roanoke on Friday, so they will know by then whether it hap happened or not, because I saw where Sarvis was up now up to 9.8 or something in the aggregate, and so the, as you said, the station is willing to, mm -hmm. to do it kind of leaving it somewhat to the two campaigns to decide. Well, uh, talk to our viewers some about the down ticket. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, just, just before yeah. we get off that, I think that uh, I think it would be a, a very interesting dynamic to have, so it would certainly shake things up. We'd, ha we'd see a much different debate with Sarvis in there. So, I, you know, not putting my personal feelings in there other than saying that we might get into some more substantive issues because you can't really attack two people at once, so might be something interesting to see. It, it, would, it would be, <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll find out very soon whether that's going to happen or not. Um, what about the, the other races, uh, Lieutenant Governor and Attorney General? Are there issues that you can see that have shaped those, or are they all just affected by the same matters that you talked about before? Uh, to some extent, they're, they're affected by the same things. And a lot of times, you know, the ticket seems to, to be affected by what's going on at the top. Um, in the Attorney General's race, you know, they're both senators. Senator Mark Herring is a Democrat, Senator Mark Shane is the Republican. And so they've been running ads, you know, based on each other's records and votes for, you know, Senate bills. Um, and, and those seem to be sort of focused on social issues, again, from coming from the Democrat uh, against the Republican. And um, some sort of law and order issues coming from the Republican to the Democrat. Um, I'm going to let you talk about the lieutenant governor's race because I haven't been really clued in on that lately. Sure. Uh, you know, I think um, Northam has kind of had the luxury of running the campaign that he wants to run. It hasn't had to, uh, I guess, e. W. Bishop E.W. Jackson has been kind of a, a lightning rod, depending on how you feel either way. But uh, he's he's made some controversial statements that he's had to, he's had some, struggled with uh, explaining. And... Uh, uh, Senator Northam has certainly been able to kind of distance himself and run a very positive issues-based campaign in a uh, um, season where we're seeing a lot of negativity in the other races. So it's a that's an interesting one to watch. You know, th there have been some statements made that the Jackson campaign has been kind of staying out of sight, or, or I don't know if you experienced that in, in the. And what you've been covering or not about whether he's out there campaigning as much in the last few weeks as he was earlier? Well, not much in this area, I can say that. I, uh, not much in the Fredericksburg area, that mm -hmm. I, at least not that I've heard the campaign hasn't sent me anything saying, hey, we're going to be in your area. But to that extent, neither has Northam mm -hmm. in, in the Fredericksburg region that I've been aware of. But in the Richmond area? I don't believe there have been any Jackson-Richmond events, to my knowledge. Not lately. Not, yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, um, what about the, the any comments on the fact that we will have an attorney general running who didn't resign office? Is this, some have tried to make something of that. Do you see that as having any impact at all? Well, I mean, legally he doesn't have to resign, but in the past, He's attorney generals, attorneys general who have run for governor have resigned. Um, I think Cuccinelli is in the position of, you know, he's got however many children. He's got a large family, and, and he needs to support them. I think that it has probably caused him some grief, some, some you know, some arguments for, coming from the Democrats that he wouldn't have had to deal with had he not been in office anymore. You know, there have been issues raised about, um, you know, the Attorney General's role in election laws and, and whether voters should be taken off the rolls. And when the Attorney General is also running in that election, you know, Democrats say that that's a conflict of interest. So I, I, I think there are probably some, some conflicts that he did, wouldn't have had to deal with had he gone ahead and resigned. Mm -hmm. So the uh, day after the election, or the week after, what, what would you, I'm not asking you again to say who the persons you think are going to win, but what do you think at that time that you and your colleagues might be writing about as being the issues that really then finally determined who got elected? That's the big question, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, is it is it turnout? 
I mean, is I that... think that's a big part of it. I mean, I think traditional conventional wisdom is that uh, lower turnout helps uh, more conservative Republican candidates, and higher turnout has traditionally helped the Democrats. Uh, the big, um, some of the big uh, demographics that people uh, can really shape these races is uh, the turnout up in Northern Virginia, which a lot of times they're kind of uh, consumed with the the federal government and federal elections and. Don't uh, don't aren't really as engaged in what happens down here in Richmond. So, I think on turnout we'll all be looking to see if the electorate in this election in any way resembled the electorate from last year in the presidential race. Um, but I think also if we're looking at issues that we're going to be talking about in the week after the election and looking back to see what affected this race, I mean I think Craig would agree there haven't been a whole lot of issues really driving the race. It's very much been a personality-driven race. Um, you know they have talked about. There, there are vast differences on issues like Medicaid expansion and um, the federal health care law and um, some education policy differences. But really, if you look at the ads and you look at what's bubbled up the most, it's been personality differences, I think. I would agree. A recent poll was out, a national poll of a fairly significant number, Esquire and I believe NBC talking about uh, nationally the vast majority of Americans were in the center. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance even to look at that, but but whether you have or not, do you, from your perspective, from the areas that you cover, is that where you think Virginians are too? That most Virginians are somewhat in the center, not not in either of the extremes, left or right. I haven't seen that poll, but I would say that's probably fairly accurate, um, and I think that applies. You know, in the past, I probably would have said Virginia was in the center and slightly to the right. And these days, over the past couple elections, I think, you know, all the talk about Virginia going purple. Um, you know, with Northern Virginia voters added into the mix, we might be shifting more away from the right and more towards the center. But I would say most people are sort of in the middle, and, and I think that poll would probably be about accurate. So, so I think that, you know, some, something I've heard from a lot of people after this and you know, moving just for a second to federal issues is that this really does kind of show how a lot of our districts are not representative of the, the larger populace and uh, you know this is I think you're gonna see um, a bipart uh, a, um, another push towards uh, bipartisan redistricting with a highlight highlighting these uh, kind of bitter divides that aren't really as prevalent in the general populace. The sitting governor has he had any impact for with the, with this election in Virginia? Well, I would say so, and not necessarily in a good way. You know, he has been sort of dogged by these questions about his gifts from Johnny Williams and Star Scientific. And while polls show that that hasn't affected the public perception of the job he's doing as governor that much, I think that it you know it has brought. Cuccinelli is involved with that because Cuccinelli had had um, taken some gifts from Johnny Williams as well. And so I, I don't think that um, the Bob McDonald tie with King Cuccinelli has been necessarily beneficial for Cuccinelli this time around. Well, I want to thank the two of you for being on. We're going to hear from two of your colleagues now. But thank you all, and we'll be interested in listening to you and reading what you have to say after the election. Thank you for Thanks, having Thank you. As we welcome our viewers back, we welcome two other members of the press corps, ones that we see around Capitol Square all the time, Jeff Shapiro, Richmond Times Dispatch, Julian Walker, the Virginian pilot. Interested in hearing your take as we are nearing the time of the election. We're talking on Monday. Our viewers will be seeing this program this coming weekend as it gets even closer. So what, what has really shaped the election from your perspective? What is shaping it as we sit here today? A number of things have, have shaped it. This appears to be shaping up as a referendum on Ken Cuccinelli more than it is about Terry McAuliffe, and that's what we've seen in poll after poll, that even those folks who say they intend to vote for Terry McAuliffe are doing so in some way as a protest vote against Ken Cuccinelli. So that's one of the driving factors here. We've seen Terry McAuliffe really try to replicate, in many ways, the playbook that Barack Obama used last year earlier in the year and in the campaign cycle, 
really hammering his opponent on the airwaves, defining his opponent in a negative fashion, uh, before voters got a chance to figure out who who Ken Cuccinelli was, or at least to hear Ken Cuccinelli's presentation and portrayal of himself. Uh, and I think that that has, has, has had an impact on the race. Um, and remember that Terry McAuliffe, because of his fundraising advantage, has had that ability to go up early and often and really go after Ken Cuccinelli. I think the other thing that we've seen is that, also speaking about the Obama playbook, is that Terry McAuliffe has really tried to replicate in some ways the data-driven campaign approach, the micro-targeting of voters, uh, those kind of um, less voters less inclined to participate in off-year elections and non-federal elections. So I think all of those things have been factors in how this race has shaped up. And we have certainly seen lots of evidence, uh, statistical as well as uh, anecdotal, that this is uh, an election in which voters seem more inclined to vote against someone as opposed to for someone. But there are a number of factors that um, are making it a, uh, a fairly memorable campaign. Uh, as we discussed uh, off camera, uh, the enormous gap in uh, support from women. There are many, many more a double-digit advantage uh, to McAuliffe, uh, that is, um, supporting the Democrat uh, because of his position on uh, abortion rights. Uh, that um, is uh, an enormous drag for the, uh, the Republican uh, ticket. Uh, also, the federal shutdown, I think, is a, a reminder that Virginia politics, particularly Virginia gubernatorial politics, uh, increasingly uh, affected by what's going on nationally. And I think there are a couple of explanations for that, one of which is the nativity rate in this state. And I don't use that in the biblical sense. I use it in the demographic sense. You know, fewer than half the voters in this state were born here. Mm -hmm. uh, more and more right. come here, myself included, Julian uh, to some degree, uh, are, are shaping the, the kind of the culture and the temperament uh, of Virginia. And these come here are bringing the voting traditions, the the, the th the thinking that, that uh, drove politics in their, their home states. I think that, the, long story short, that's made for a much more national atmosphere. So in the case of the shutdown, uh, using the polls as an example, there seems to be a, a good deal more blame heaped on the Republicans uh, than the Democrats. And in places like Northern Virginia, where federal politics regional politics and local politics are, are one and the same. It's clearly driving voters' interests. And I think that's also uh, evident in, in Hampton Roads uh, and uh, in other areas around the state. And we, this could have such a profound effect uh, that both parties are concerned about what it means for legislative races. Yeah. Democrats think they may be able to pick up some Republicans think they, they may lose more than they'd, they'd anticipated. So I was going to ask you about that. Is, that. is that somewhat in play down in the Hampton Roads area, or as you see where it could be affecting House races there? Well, I don't, I don't know so much about Hampton Roads. I think it's, to Jeff's point, I think you'll see a lot more of that in Northern Virginia mm -hmm. because that is in the Beltway right out of D.C. Right. And as Jeff said, you know, so much of that layers on top of each other. And so there is a lack of uh, differentiation in a lot of respects. Um, I think what you'll see in Hampton Roads is, going back to the point about really the kind of data-driven campaign approach and about targeting voters, is that we've seen Hampton Roads on the local level, both in terms of local elections and legislative elections, that Hampton Roads tends to go Republican. But in presidential years, we've seen Barack Obama do quite well the le these last two cycles. And I think that that is, Hampton Roads in many ways is, is much more a swing area uh, than a lot of the other more kind of heavily or densely populated regions of the state. I think that, what to Jeff's point about the legislative races, I think there's a couple things that, that I've noticed recently. Uh, one, just in the past two weeks, we've seen Tom Rust, who is up in Northern Virginia in a swing district, uh, facing a, a stiff reelection challenge from a well-funded Democrat. And in the space of a couple weeks, you've seen him come out in favor of repealing the hybrid tax that is part of the transportation funding package approved this year, a bill he voted for, and 
House Speaker Bill Howell coming out and saying he's going to be the new transportation chairman. Both of those things struck me as really uh, kind of smelling of a sense of we've got to insulate this guy. And I think you're seeing that in several Northern Virginia House seats. I don't think you'll see that necessarily play out as much in Hampton Roads. I think those seats are still going to end up, by and large, even though you've got several Republicans who are not seeking re-election, veteran Republicans down in Hampton Roads. I think for the most part, you'll see Republicans hold on to those seats. Um, but certainly Republicans are concerned at this point about the spillover effect and how it will impact the legislative races. And to Julian's point, in terms of the theatrics of this, uh, House Republicans, as a caucus, are also planning an event this week to talk about improvements in, in education. So it, it, it all may look like um, uh, a bunch of Republicans uh, essentially trying to take the initiative. Yeah, they are, but in politics, you know, the best defense is a good offense. And also, um, speaking to the, the, the jitters of, of Republicans, uh, obviously they acknowledge that their candidate for governor and lieutenant governor have their issues. Of what they're trying to do is establish a firewall at that tertiary race for attorney general. So there's a lot of money and a lot of personnel going into saving Mark Obenshane. Conversely, there's a lot of money and a lot of personnel going into helping uh, Mark Herring. It's been a long time since the Democrats uh, swept. I have to go back to 1989. Uh, but the, just by the, the movement of money and personnel, clearly indicates that the Republicans have some fairly profound concerns. And talking about resource shifting just quickly, uh, to Jeff's point, it is worth noting that in the last couple of weeks we've seen a significant tapering in the investment that Ken Cuccinelli is making in terms of broadcast and cable uh, television advertising purchases. So again, that suggests that they're trying to use what resources they have left to try to either have boots on the ground or to try to some way recalibrate the campaign to try to pull this out. In endorsements, um, do those have some any impact? There have been some interesting endorsements, one from some from the Times Dispatch. Or non endorsements. Yes, or not endorsements. I guess that was the more interesting, most interesting part. Um, some papers are doing it, some are not. Well, the pilot actually came out pretty early this year with its endorsements, which I think surprised some people. The, the one caveat that I always like to add is that the newsroom and the editorial department, there is a Understand. firewall between yes. them, and right. what they do is completely separate from what we on the news gathering side do. Um, but yes, the, the pilots came out early this year, and people who are perhaps critics of the pilot would say that they were predictable. But I think that, as you point out, uh, what the Times-Dispatch did by offering a non-endorsement in the gubernatorial race certainly raised some eyebrows. Uh, given, of course, the newspaper's editorial pages, long Republican history. Um, it, it did uh, endorse a Democrat for lieutenant governor and a Republican for attorney general. So uh, the, but the, the conventional wisdom is, and I don't know that many people would quarrel with this, that given its presumed Republican reflex, this non-endorsement would clearly be a, an indication of great concern uh, with the, uh, the Republican nominee. And the editorial page has been pretty tough with uh, Ken Cuccinelli on, on lots of issues. And on that score, I would just quickly point out, it is such an interesting, because of the way that the Times-Dispatch's editorial was framed, it is such an interesting question and a hypothetical one, but about the game of what ifs. The Times-Dispatch pointed out that it would have gladly endorsed Lieutenant Governor Bill Bowling, a Republican, had he run. They pointed out they would have endorsed a Democrat had a former member of the House of Delegates, Ward Armstrong, uh, from Henry County, had run. So to me, there's also this, and it's just a parlor game, but it's intriguing in that mm -hmm. had this race shaped up differently, had Bill Bowling been the nominee, had there been some other candidate on the Democratic side, this might look very differently. We might be coasting towards a Bill Bowling governor, the re-election of Ken Cuccinelli, potentially, as attorney general, and who knows what would have happened in the lieutenant governor's race. Uh, it is a remarkable uh, series of events, given that uh, McAuliffe won the Democratic nomination by default. Uh, most Democrats believe that this would be a lower turnout election. Bob McDonald would be at the peak of his powers. Uh, there would be uh, all of the 
the necessary ingredients for a, uh, a Republican victory. But of course, uh, much has transpired. And, and don't sell the Democratic nominee short. He's been a lot more disciplined this go around than he was his first uh, attempt at governor in, in, in 2009. So there's an improved Democratic mm -hmm. candidate here, too. Look forward, and our viewers do too, to uh, reading you, your comments both before and then after the election. And thank you for being on This Week in Richmond. Thank you. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosting an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at VirginiaRodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.